from Microbe TV. This is Beyond the Noise, episode number 15, recorded on September 6, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, Cutting to the Chase on Important Health Topics. And today, I'd like to take a closer look at Paul's column called Lawyer Tricks, The Unanswerable Question. So maybe we should start, Paul, by talking about how do lawyers and scientists differ in their approach to scientific truths? Right. So um, if, for example, someone is worried about whether or not a vaccine causes a particular problem, what a scientist will do is they'll go out and try and figure out, number one, does this problem that people are worried about, is, is it biologically plausible? Does it make sense? Can you figure out a reason for why that would be true? And even if, if one can't make sense of it, so for example, the notion that the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine causes autism they never made any biological sense. But in any case, uh, to the credit of public health officials and academicians and physicians, they studied it because it is studyable. It is testable. And it's understandable how a parent could, could be worried, right? My child was fine. They got a vaccine. Now they're not fine. Could the vaccine have done it? And so then what you have is you have had a series of now 18 studies in seven different countries on three different continents looking at children who either did or didn't get that vaccine. And accounting for all possible other differences. I mean, were these two groups the same in terms of their socioeconomic background, their medical background, their healthcare seeking behavior? So you can control for that one variable, receipt of the MMR vaccine. And the studies have all been the same. The MMR vaccine in no case put you at increased risk of autism. So from a scientist standpoint or, or a clinician standpoint, a truth has emerged. It never made biological sense, and now there's no epidemiological evidence to support it. The lawyers, however, when they get scientists or clinicians in the courtroom, don't approach it that way. They approach it from a different way. Um, so what a scientist will do is they'll create a hypothesis. The hypothesis is the null hypothesis. MMR vaccine does not cause autism. You can either reject that null hypothesis, reject that, and show that, in fact, you're more likely to get autism if you got the vaccine, or you cannot reject it, meaning you're no more likely to get it. But what you can never do is you can never accept the null hypothesis. You can never prove never. And that doesn't do very well in a courtroom setting, or frankly, doesn't do very well often in the way that we uh, interact with the public. Because you, the, the lawyer would say, well, can, can you say that it never causes it? Because a parent would say, well, I mean, I, I, I'm, I may not be that one in 100,000, I may be, be that one in a million or one in a billion. So you can't prove it. And so it's never resolved. And I think it's, um, it's hard for us to try and, and deal with, with that notion that you can't prove never. I'll give you a couple specific examples. When I was a little boy, I used to watch the t television show Superman. This is the one with George Reeve, who preceded mm -hmm. Christopher Reeve, who, who was the later Superman. But in any case, what he did was he flew. When you're five years old and you're watching television, Television does not lie. And he flew. You saw him looking down at the, the, the city below him. His cape would flow behind him. So I went out in the backyard. I stood on a, a small height, small chair, put a towel around myself, put my hands in front of me like Superman did with that interlocking thumb grip, which I thought was sort of key to the whole flight experience. And I tried to fly unsuccessfully a few times. That didn't prove I couldn't fly. Um, I could have tried a hundred times or a million times or, or, or 10 million times. That would have only made it more statistically unlikely. So from the standpoint of the lawyer, they would go, well, you can't really prove that you, you can't fly, even though it, it doesn't make biological sense and you never showed that you could. And I think that's what you're sort of always up against. Well, by that logic, you can't prove that any vaccine or any drug, you can't even prove that beer won't kill you, Right. Right. You, you can prove nothing. I mean, there are mathematical theorems which are, in, in its essence, proofs, but it doesn't work that way with epidemiological studies. So you gave two examples in the column. One of them is a test, is a deposition with Dr. Catherine Edwards using the word designed. And, and I think it's worthwhile to, to recount that. Right. So, so the lawyer who was interviewing, um, Dr. Edwards, who's a, a, a professor of pediatrics at Vanderbilt and certainly a, a superb vaccine re researcher, 
and thoughtful vaccine researcher. So, so she was being deposed uh, for a particular court proceeding, and she was asked the question, uh, were these trials designed to determine whether or not a vaccine caused autism? So, for example, when we did the polio vaccine trials or the whooping cough vaccine trials or the pneumococcal vaccine trials, were we thinking about whether these these vaccines would cause autism? Well, the answer to that question was no. Uh, she had no choice in many ways but to say no. But but what what the the lawyer who worked for a anti vaccine group called ICANN, which is Informed Consent Action Network, what he did was he made her look bad because, you know, she said, well, well you, so you were looking for whether or not vaccines cause autism, so therefore there's no way you were going to find it. But what, but what exists for vaccines that actually doesn't exist so much on the drug side is something called the vaccine safety data link. So the minute that vaccines roll out, you very quickly know in real time and through this system that involves about 7 million people and 500,000 children in this country, who got the vaccine, who didn't, and you'll see whether there's a problem. I think there's no better example of that than the COVID vaccines. When the COVID vaccines were, were reviewed by the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee in December of 2020, those studies, 40,000 people for Pfizer, 30,000 for Moderna, were not designed to pick up myocarditis, inflammation of the heart muscle. But when they rolled out and the vaccine safety data link was very quickly able to pick up that myocarditis was a rare cause of, of a, a rare phenomenon that was associated with these, these two mRNA vaccines at a rate of roughly one in 50,000. You were never going to pick that up in a, in a, pre, uh, a pre-approval or pre-authorization or pre-licensure study because it was too rare. The same thing was true with Johnson & Johnson's vector virus vaccine, where it caused blood clots, including severe blood clots in the brain, which could be fatal, that occurred in one in 200,000 people. That was very quickly picked up in a matter of months that this was a problem. But neither of those trials, none of those trials were ever designed to pick it up. So the way this this particular lawyer made it sound, it was like, well, you can never pick these things up because you, you didn't design the trials. But in fact, there are systems in place that do pick it up that are designed to really pick up anything that occurs uh, within a couple months of getting a vaccine. But as you point out later in the column, you know, autism affects one in 100 children in the U.S. So that kind of side effect you would definitely see in your trial, even if you hadn't listed autism as one of the uh, adverse events, right? Right. And, and that's common enough where you would even pick that up in a pre-licensure or pre-authorization trial right. as compared to the vaccine safety data link. No, that's a good point. So maybe Dr. Edwards should have said it was not designed to pick it up, but it would have given the frequency. Yes, and often the way that these these depositions work or the way uh, courtroom proceedings work is you're not really given the, the chance to explain the kind of things <laughs> that we just explained yes. in five or ten minutes. You're asked yes or no. Yes, well, I have been I have been deposed as well, and I learned to quickly get in words that they may not like. Uh, and if they say, just answer the question, please, you know, argue with them. I've gotten in arguments with lawyers. There's no judge there in the uh, deposition room, although you can threaten to call a judge and then they will back off. Actually, I've had that happen <laughs> as well. Let's call a judge and see if you have to answer this question. All right. Never mind. Strike it from the record. It's a crazy thing. The other uh, the other thing about this is, OK, so. If there's a rare side event that you only pick up when you vaccinate hundreds of thousands of people, would that say that parents are justified in waiting to get certain vaccines until they're in more people? Well, again, there are no risk-free choices. I mean, you could choose, for example, with the COVID vaccine when it was tested in 40,000 or 30,000 people to say, you know, I don't know whether this causes a rare side effect. So I'm going to wait till a million people are vaccinated or 2 million or 5 million. But COVID was common. Um, COVID was killing 1,000 people a day, 2,000 people a day, 3,000 people a day in, in 2020 and 2020, 2021. So that's the other side of it. I mean, there's, there's, there are no risk-free choices. I mean, I think what we should do when we're trying to make medical decisions is take the lesser risk. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, you know, I was, in, uh, I was at the European Society for Clinical Virology meeting last week, and I spoke with a number of people with European from European countries where there are not they did not mandate covid vaccines yet the netherlands for example got very high uptick and and it worked for them so i felt uh, i felt sad that we can't do that here in the us uh, yes i'm with you one more uh, one more question about this then you had a second example where um 
the the lawyer said, is it your testimony that the MMR vaccine cannot cause autism? And in every case, Dr. Edwards said that's correct. And then he then tripped her up because the epidemiological studies, the 18 that you mentioned, uh, cannot prove that, right? Right. Well, it's the sort of thing, anything's possible. I mean, is it possible that when I was five and I went out on the back lawn and I put that towel around me and put my hands in front of me <laughs> and tried to fly, was it possible I could fly? I think the answer to that question is no. I don't think I, I'm not a bird. I don't think I have what it takes to fly yeah. um, or whatever it took for, grit, for for Superman to fly. But, um, you know, it's it's um, it's interesting that when um, the MMR autism issue was brought up in 1998, when Andrew Wakefield published that paper, he, he sort of he had three reasons for why this was true, for why the MMR vaccine would cause autism. He said, because you've given these three vaccines together, that suppresses the immune system. Now, he he could have very easily determined whether or not children who had gotten that vaccine had a, a blunting of their immune response by looking at a variety of immunologic assays. He didn't do that. Then he said that because the immune response was suppressed, that allowed measles vaccine virus to go to the intestinal mucosal surface mm -hmm. and, and damage the intestinal mucosal surface. Well, he biopsied those children. He could very easily have determined whether there was evidence for measles vaccine virus in any of those intestinal cells. He didn't do that either. He then said, well, because the intestine was damaged, that allowed for the entrance of encephalopathic proteins, meaning brain damaging proteins that would enter the circulation, then cross the intact blood brain barrier and cause autism. Well, what were those encephalopathic proteins? He argued, well, maybe it's casein, maybe it's gluten. I mean, just threw a few things out there. But again, he could have tested that. He didn't test anything. It was like sort of this series of impossible events for which he had no evidence. And that nonetheless got that paper published. So I think that in the end, it's very hard to convey to most people this uncertainty, right? And especially if parents are trying to make decisions about vaccines. And I've always thought, you know, don't be so uh, shy about saying a vaccine can't do this. But Dr. You see, Dr. Edwards said, in my opinion, the vaccines cannot cause autism. And then they said, ah, but these epidemiological studies uh, don't prove that. And that's a real problem. But it was in her opinion. So I think that's an important qualifier. Right. And then they, they put it on their website. It was their sort of gotcha moment. They said, wait till you see this video. You're not going to believe what you see. And, you know, he I think that this lawyer yeah, um, yeah. kind of tweeted, you know, Joe Rogan, look, here's us debating whether or not. Yep. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't a debate at all. Right. It was just a, a way to misrepresent yep. the information and to confuse people. So what, what do we do about this, Paul? What's is there a solution to this problem? Um, I think at some level we have to be able to trust the American public to understand what are the strengths and limitations of these kinds of studies. But there are enormous strengths to this, these studies. I, I would say this. I mean, if you look, for example, when Andrew Wakefield published that paper in the late 1990s and you asked parents of children with autism, do you think that the, the vaccines could have caused it? 90% would have said yes at that time. And then what happened over the period of the next 10 years, 15 years, was these studies were done and done and done and done. Now, if you ask parents of children with autism, do you think vaccines could cause it? About 15% say yes. So, so there is value to doing their studies. It is valuable to try and get the information out there. Um, so I think it's worthwhile, but I do think we have to be careful when we, when we talk about these. See, the problem is, as a scientist, the, the, the worst thing you can do when you write a scientific paper is ever go beyond the data in front of you. You're considered a good scientist if you have a series of caveats in your, in your discussion section that shows what you can and can't say based on your data and how more studies may be able to offer mm -hmm. greater light. Um, but when you, but but that doesn't work well when you're trying to explain things to the public. It doesn't because it sounds like you're you're unsure and you don't know. Yeah. I think you can say comfortably at this point that the MMR vaccine doesn't cause autism, even though in theory, um, the way that the the uh, the the um, scientific studies are are, are are constructed or epidemiological studies in this case, where you have a null hypothesis that you can reject or not reject, but can never accept. You can't really say that, but it's it's true. I don't think MMR vaccine causes autism. And, you know, if people aren't getting an MMR vaccine for that reason, they're making a terrible choice. Because in this case, you're starting to see cases of measles. I mean, there were 85 uh, children in Columbus, Ohio, who got measles, many of whom were hospitalized and none of whom were vaccinated. 
Um, this, this, it's, it strikes me. I've actually just got an email from someone uh, saying it was a news reporter who said, you know, should we worry about uh, immigrant children who are coming into the this country who are unvaccinated? We should worry about American children who are unvaccinated. Yeah. I mean, these outbreaks of pertussis in 2010 in California, or 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 measles in California in 2014, those were American children who were unvaccinated. So, um, I've seen the enemy, and they are us. So maybe the thing to do is to say, all right, this vaccine has been in 80,000 people and there are no serious adverse events attributed to the vaccine. But if the frequency of an of a, uh, adverse event is one in 100,000 or one in a million, we wouldn't have seen it and we won't see it. And so just remember that. And I don't think anyone said that at the beginning of the COVID vaccine release. I don't think anyone said we might see myocarditis because no one expected it, right? Right. It wasn't imaginable. Yeah. So but I'm not even sure that would work because I think the public sees what they want to see and uh, they see scientists saying we can't prove this. And they say, oh, then it must do it. So uh, only people who think clearly <laughs> are going to get around that. I think it's a real problem. It's, it's hard to, because you can't prove never. It's hard right. to be totally reassuring, even though. All the evidence suggests that the truth has emerged and it's not a problem. That's what you're up against. I must say that even in a courtroom, um, they uh, they think they deal in absolutes, but they don't often get it right. Right. Absolutely. They don't often convict the right person. They often uh, convict the wrong person. So, um, you know, they portray themselves as black or white, but they're not. Anyway, you can read that column at uh, Paul pull off its substack. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you.